I hold in my hand a little card. It's about maybe two inches by three. It's not very big at all. Not big enough to get anybody into any trouble. It has some wording and lettering on the front of it. The top of the card, it has two words, American Express. Uh, Then it has a row of numbers. I've gone over the numbers fairly carefully. There is no evidence of 666 among them. (laughs) And so I'm confident in the use of this card. And then on the bottom line, it has a name. Now, it depends which iteration of the card you look at as to which name you will find. Over the years, there have been some fairly well-known names listed on the card. Ron Reagan, Tom Landry, Stephen King, and then this one, Randall Roberts. Randall who? (laughs) Well, let me tell you a little bit about this particular card, because since the day this card arrived in the mail, I haven't left home without it. (laughs) I received this card quite some years ago and realized that in my hand I held power. There were great things about this card. In fact, I learned immediately that there was good news and there was bad news. The good news was this. This card has no credit limit. In other words, you don't risk standing in line at Sears or standing in line at Nordstrom and handing in your card and having the checker say to you, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm sorry, sir, you're over your limit. None of that, no limit. You can spend and charge and buy to your heart's content. That's the good news. The bad news is that this card is to be paid every month in full. But somehow when I first received the card, the good news outweighed the bad. And when I held it in my hand, I realized I have buying power, and now I can get all the things that I need. And I was surprised to realize then just how much I actually needed. (laughs) Things I hadn't realized I needed before, now I most definitely needed. And so I got shoes and clothes and suits. I realized that the establishing establishments in town for dining took the card. In fact, the finer establishments in other towns took the card in payment. In fact, if you wanted to, you could actually not only go to other towns, but other cities, other states, and other countries. And for a little extra charge included, you could have travel insurance to boot. It was wonderful. I began to realize what I needed. It would be much like now getting a card and realizing I need an iMac and an iPhone and an iPad and an iTouch and I want and I need and I don't care what it costs because (laughs) there's no credit limit. Now, some weeks later, I received a little package in the mail from American Express. It was quite a bit more substantive than had been the first envelope in which I had received the card. And I must admit, I opened it with a far lesser degree of anticipation than I had opened the first envelope. I had a suspicion what was there, so I opened it, and I began to rifle through those pages. I was looking for just one figure. Unfortunately, I found it. It was right on the back page, right toward the bottom of the page. There it was, clearly in black and white. Total amount due. And I looked at that number, and I thought, how can one person, a man at that, (laughs) don't write me any letters, you know it's true, (laughs) possibly spend that much money in one month's time? That's absolutely, utterly impossible. Can't be done. No way. Now, I thought about that, and I thought, not only is this due, it is due now. Well, I didn't sleep that night or the next, tossing and turning, trying to think, what am I going to do? How in the world am I going to pay that amount off? I'm going to spare you the gory details as to how much, but trust me, a couple of sleepless nights had me scheming and planning and thinking, what in the world am I going to do about this? And finally, I decided. I had received this fine little card in the first place on my father's credit. 
It was because he had good credit, because he had good resources, that I had it in the first place. So I would go to my father. I would throw myself absolutely on his mercy. Dad, I'll pay you back. I'll work night and day. I'll do anything I need to do, anything. Just help me this time. So the plan was made, and then came the fateful day. The day I went in to talk to my father. I had some preamble, some planned words, laid it out to him. I think he could tell what was coming. And then finally I said, I just wonder if you might help me a bit with this month's bill. What do you mean, help me a bit? Well, like all of it. <laughs> Maybe you could help me pay all. How much is it? Well, unfortunately, I shared with him the amount. My father's eyes grew large. His mouth dropped open. And he said some pretty straight things. Things like, how in the world can one person <laughs> spend that much money in one month's time? It's not possible. How could you possibly do that? Well, he ranted and raved for a while, and I was backtracking and pleading, please, Dad, just this time, just spot me, just help me now. Well, he must have seen my desperation and despair. Because then he did something absolutely unthinkable. He paused for a moment. He looked at me, and he said, All right, I'll help you. This time. This time, I will pay it all. You don't have to worry about it, period. Well, you can imagine you can imagine the load that was lifted off my mind and my wallet. It was an incredible experience. I walked out of there as though I was walking on air. I was so excited. I didn't know what to do. wanted to tell somebody, grab somebody. You won't believe what my father just did for me. But I also had one other thought in my mind. I thought, I'm going to learn from this. This is not going to be repeated again. And so I sharpened my pencil, got a white notebook, my calculator, got that bill, that packet of pages from American Express, and sat down and began to go over them carefully, one at a time, to figure out just where did all this money go? How did I go so wrong? And it was then that I came across one entry that really got to me. I remembered exactly what had occurred. It was two or three, four weeks ago. My brother had come to me. He had found a new pair of shoes. He needed them for work. They were on sale, $19.99. He said, can you spot me 20 bucks? I don't have it right now. I'll pay you when I get paid at the end of the week. I said, spot you 20 bucks? Are you kidding me? I've got the card. Just put it on the card. Pay me when you get paid. He said, done. And so he had done that. But he hadn't paid me back. I saw that entry, and it just made me angry. I hate it when people don't pay me back for what they borrow. I couldn't understand what in the world he was thinking. And so I found him. I hunted him down, and I said, hey, look, here, here's the receipt, 20 bucks. You told me you were going to pay me when you got paid. Two or three pay periods have gone by. Where's the 20? Cough it up. And he had the audacity to say to me, well, I, I spent it. Can, can you wait until the next time? I'll get paid next Friday. I said, no, I'm not waiting until next Friday. It's been three weeks. Twice you've been paid. You told me you were going to pay me. Now pay up. Well, unfortunately, our sister heard the exchange. And being a sister, she did what sisters sometimes do. And so Dad said, Randy... Let's talk. I wasn't very happy about that at all. But we sat down to talk, and here's the question he asked me. He said, I, I just want to get this straight. This that just happened between you and me and between you and your brother, all this that just happened, is that the kind of world you want to live in? Because if it is, then I want you to pay me back every last penny. Nobody. 
Nobody, and I mean nobody, in this sanctuary is happier than I am to tell you that story never happened. <laughs> never occurred. Never took place. Or did it? Because Jesus told the story in its original form. Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter, page 1463 in your pew Bible. He tells it at a time when Peter comes to him with a question. Jesus has been talking about this thing called forgiveness. And it's kind of gotten to Peter, gotten to him enough that he wants to know more about it. So he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, come on, you know what life is like. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I don't want you doing the same thing to me over and over again. So Jesus says, Peter, I have a question for you, a very specific kind of question, and that question is this. How often shall my brother or my sister sin against me and I forgive them? How often, Jesus? Well, it is in that context and helping to explain his answer to that question that Jesus tells the story. I want to read the incident and the story to you. Matthew chapter 18, we begin reading in verse 21. Matthew records, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive a brother or sister from your heart. In other words, in sincerity. Jesus, Peter asks, how often? Now, he was acquainted with some of the scholars of his day who said, you can forgive another person up to three times, but three times they've had their limit. That's it, out of the pool. We're done here. But Peter wanted to be generous, apparently. He doubled that and added one and said, Jesus, how often ought I to forgive a brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus said, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times, or it could also be translated 70 times seven. In other words, Peter, true forgiveness, real forgiveness doesn't keep track. It is offered every time it is needed. Now, Peter must not have liked that answer any better than you and I probably like that answer. And so Jesus, seeing it in his face, told him a story. It's a story that basically has two elements to it. First element is that of a ridiculously large debt that is forgiven. Second element is that of a ridiculously small debt that is remembered. And so he begins with the first a ridiculously large debt that is forgiven. Do you know what it is to have a large debt? A debt that you have no hope of repaying? Peter Stanizek knows what that's like. Peter Stanizek is a worker in the Canadian oil fields. Peter had gone out and bought himself three or four years ago a new cell phone. 
Along with that cell phone, he took advantage of the special the company was offering, and he purchased their $10 a month unlimited data package. He had plans for that cell phone because it could be tethered to his, his laptop computer, and he could download whatever it was that he needed or wanted straight through his phone and onto his computer. And so that's what Peter Stanizek went and did. He immediately began downloading everything he wanted, HD movies, applications, anything he could think of, he downloaded onto his computer. It was in use most of the time that month. And then came the bill. He opened that bill. He looked at it, and his jaw must have hit the floor. Because the phone company said, Peter Stanizek, you owe us $60,000. True story. Stanizek must have thought, absolutely impossible. How can one person in one month spend that much money on a cell phone? Absolutely impossible. He picked up the phone. He called the company and said, this is ludicrous. Not only can I not pay it, there is no way I spent it. And the phone company said, calm down, we'll check our records. And so they checked their records. They contacted Peter again, and they said, you're exactly right. We were incorrect. You don't owe us $60,000. You owe us (laughs) $85,000. Stanizek said, what are you talking about? Do you know what they said to him? Read the fine print. Read the fine print. They stood by the fact that that is actually what he owed. But the phone company said, we will be generous. We will be gracious. And so they wrote off the vast majority of that bill, still telling him what you do, however, owe us is $3,243 for one month. That you will pay. So Peter knows what it's like. To have a bill that you simply cannot pay, impossible, no way, I can't pay that. Do you know what that's like? Peter and the man in the parable would have understood each other very well because the truth is, in this parable that Jesus tells, the man owes a ridiculously large amount of money. And when I say it is ridiculously large, it absolutely is. Scholars have tried to help us get our mind around the fact that 10,000 talents or 10,000 bags of gold is an incredible amount of money. Two scholars, let me give you just two. There are others, but just two who try to put it into language that we today can understand. First one says this, 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold is the equivalent of one day's pay at that time, of one day's pay for 100 million workers. One day's pay for 100 million people. And Jesus says, that's his debt. The people would have laughed in his face as he told that story. There is no way one person can run up that kind of a debt. What is this, the U.S. government? No way. (laughs) Can't be done. The man continues, the scholar continues to say, if you want it in a little bit different language, then think of it this way. If you make adjustments for fluctuating prices of precious metals and inflation, then the actual value of these 10,000 talents in our money today would be about $1 billion. That's with a B, $1 billion. Debt? Oh, It's a ridiculously large debt, one he could never hope to be able to repay. Impossible. Absolutely cannot be done. And so the man has a debt, says Jesus, one that he will never hope to be able to repay. Do you know what it is to face a debt like that, maybe even in your moral life? I am indebted to somebody to the degree that I will never be able to repay it. So what does the man do? He falls on his knees to plead and beg, please give me a chance. Please give me an opportunity. Please, I'll work it off. Really? Seriously? How absurd is that? You're going to work it off? Think about what Dave Ramsey said just recently. Dave Ramsey of the Total Money Makeover As we were going in our country through the struggles over the debt ceiling and what would happen, Ramsey put it in language most of us can understand. 
Here's what he said. If you want to have a sense, he said, of where we are right now, think about it like this. It would, like, it would be like an average family who makes $58,000 a year spending $75,000 a year and on top of that being $317,000 in credit card debt. And to add the parable, then it would be like that family falling on their knees and saying, but don't worry, we'll work it off. We'll work it off. And the master says, sell him, sell him, sell his wife, sell his kids, sell them all, fully knowing that will not pay off the debt, but feeling like he would get his pound of flesh at least in revenge. But as the man continues to plead and beg, suddenly the master has an absolute change of heart, a total turnaround. He looks at the man who pleads, and he says, All right, forgiven, done, finished. End of debt, end of discussion, end of problem. You are free. Can you imagine can you just see him in your mind's eye as he leaps and dances and cartwheels out of the presence of the master, knowing the tremendous joy that comes from having been forgiven a debt that is ridiculously large? And then he sees someone. He sees a face he knows. And as soon as he sees that face, he has a memory of another debt. And this debt is a, re a debt that is ridiculously small. Do you want a, a sense, a feeling of the size difference between the two debts? Another biblical scholar helps us with that. He says, this is what it would be like if this debt were actually contained in the small coins of the day. To be able to have enough coins to represent the 10,000 talent debt, he said, you would need to have men holding bags of 60 pounds in weight filled with coins. There would be one man after another, one yard apart, each holding a 60-pound bag of coins that would stretch for five miles. That's the first debt, the 10,000 talent debt. But, he says, if you want to know the size of the debt that this other servant owed him, same coins, the size of that debt was such that it would fit in one pocket. Five miles, 60-pound bags, a man every yard along that five-mile path, or a pocket full of change. And to that man who owes him a pocket full of change, he goes. He grabs him around the throat. Jesus says he chokes him, and he says, pay me what you owe me. I'm sick of this. You won't do this to me again. Give it to me now. And word gets back. And the master calls him in and asks, is this the kind of world you want to live in? Now, please remember, all of that is said in answer to the question of Peter, Lord, how many times ought I to forgive someone who sins against me? So what we must gather at the very least is this, that Jesus says you forgive as many times as it is required because true forgiveness does not keep track. It is offered every time it's needed. Now, scholars are fairly well agreed that Jesus is here drawing on an Old Testament story found in the book of Genesis chapter 4 involving a man named Lamech. Lamech was done dirty by somebody. We're not told what the deed was, but he lashed out in response and killed the person who did him dirty. And then he went back to his own family and said to them, I want to make a pronouncement here today, said Lamech, and here's my pronouncement. If Cain is going to be able to take vengeance seven times over for someone who does him harm, then Lamech will take vengeance 77 times over. 
So up to that point in the biblical story, the 77-fold response was the response of retaliation. Now, Jesus says, the 77-fold response is the response of forgiveness and grace. As often as needed. Now, we can't leave that without recognizing a question that arises. It's a very understandable question. And that is, if I respond in forgiveness every time it is needed, doesn't that just open the door to my life, to being taken advantage of, to being abused, to being mistreated? Am I not just hanging out a sign that says, here I am, walk all over me, do anything you will, and I'll forgive you? Well, remember the context. Remember that we are in Matthew 18. Do you remember what immediately precedes this story? What immediately precedes it, we studied two weeks ago today. It was the process that Jesus put in place if there is in the community of faith an issue between two people. It was not merely to be overlooked. Jesus said, no. Go talk to the person eyeball to eyeball. If they won't hear you, take some others with you. If they still won't hear you, bring in the church, involve the church. And if they still won't hear you, says Jesus, draw a boundary, set a limit, say, I forgive you, but I will no longer tolerate that behavior. In other words, there is a difference between forgiveness and tolerance. Forgiveness is that which says, I release you from any emotional indebtedness to me. I release you from that. I let go of my right to strike back in anger or in vengeance. I choose to let go of the bitterness and the rage inside of me, even the hurt inside of me. In fact, I choose to even let go of any ill will toward you. That's forgiveness. But to say, I tolerate, tolerance, that means I allow. I may not like, but I accept. In some cases even, I condone what you are doing. There is a very big forgiveness, be, very big difference between forgiveness and tolerance. Lewis Smedes helps me in terms of thinking about that with these words. Writing of the difference between the two, he says, forgive me and you heal yourself. Tolerate everything I do, and you are in for a lot of trouble. You can forgive someone almost anything, but you cannot tolerate everything. Whenever people try to live or work together, they have to decide on the sorts of things they will put up with. Listen to this last sentence. The group that puts up with everything eventually kills itself. You cannot tolerate all kinds of behavior. Jesus himself says there is a time to set a boundary, to set a limit. But you can always forgive. Forgiveness says, I release you from emotional indebtedness. Smeeds, after writing that quotation, tells a story. A story that happened not far from where he lived. It was a difficult part of town, kind of run down. There was a dilapidated old store where Old Joe, the local Italian grocery man, ran a grocery store, a run-down grocery store. It wasn't a nice place necessarily, didn't have a lot of money. In fact, he even sold day-old bread. But the people from the neighborhood frequented Old Joe's grocery store because they loved Old Joe and because the things were cheaper. They would come in, the parents would, and they would buy his bread. The kids would come in and buy the donuts. And then one day, three young toughs from the neighborhood strode into Old Joe's grocery. And at gunpoint, they took everything of value that Old Joe had, his money and any other items lying about that might have some value. And then, as they were about to walk out the door with no need for it whatsoever, one young tough named Sam, shot a prostrate Joe in the stomach, and they left. Well, it didn't take long. The police apprehended them. He was arrested, and he was charged, was out on bail. The neighborhood was talking about it, 
and people were absolutely irate because they loved old Joe. Well, Sam's parents were humiliated, shamed so much they could hardly look anyone in the eye. They went to the hospital to say to old Joe, we're so sorry, we don't know what happened, why he did that. And one night they even took Sam, who rather begrudgingly apologized. Do you know what old Joe did? He said to Sam, Sam, you're forgiven. In fact, when I get out of here, depending on what happens to you, you're more than welcome in my store. In fact, I would like you to come to my store and work. If you'll work cleaning, I'll pay you, and you won't have to rob anymore. He forgave. But then the prosecutors came knocking, and they said, the state is pursuing the charges, and you need to testify. And old Sam testified, sad but clear. And the consequences were strong in Sam's life. Old Joe forgave, but old Joe said, I cannot tolerate certain behavior. Do you think Jesus might have meant that here in Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter? Do anything in your power to work issues out, recognizing that a time may come when a boundary line needs to be drawn, but also understanding that in sincerity and from your heart, you are called upon to forgive in any case it is needed. Why? Because you have been forgiven a ridiculously large debt. So why won't you forgive a ridiculously large Small one. We've been talking about it now for four weeks. This is our fourth week talking about forgiveness. We've talked about it long enough, and I've had a conversations with enough of you that I've realized this. There are people seated in this congregation this morning, seated here, whose lives would be changed, in fact, whose lives would be transformed if they spoke three simple words. I forgive you. So what about it? You've been forgiven a ridiculously large debt. Are you willing? Are you ready? to forgive a ridiculously small.